All right, please take your Bibles, go back to Psalm uh, 9. This is the last Psalm that I'll be preaching through. And then from next Sunday, we'll be starting a, a brand new book, which coincides pretty well. A brand new book, and then we'll be having our church anniversary as well. So Psalm 9. Psalm 9, the title of the sermon comes from verse number 1, which says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. The title of the sermon this morning is, All Thy Marvelous Works. All Thy Marvelous Works. I'm going to uh, be basically focusing on that last phrase toward the end of the sermon, more, more than the beginning. So, if we have a look at the first instruction that it says there, well, it's not so much an instruction. It's a commitment from the psalmist toward God. He says, I will praise thee, O Lord. Hey, as believers, as, as children of God, we need to set this in our hearts, a commitment to the Lord that we will praise the Lord. Okay? And you say, yeah, we do praise the Lord. We do. We come to church and we sing the, the psalms and, and the praises and the hymns and we sing songs and we praise the Lord and we thank Him for all His answered prayers and we thank Him for His salvation. We do those things. Surely we do. But notice the second part of that sentence. It says, with all my heart. Okay, so we need to praise God with all that we have in our hearts. Okay, with the fullness of our hearts. And if we are familiar with that verse, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, then we're going to fully understand what it means to praise God. And it's not just with all our hearts, but that translates through our mouth. Okay, I know how much you praise God by what's coming out of your mouth. Okay, now this is not the only time we're instructed to praise God with all our hearts, with all our whole heart. I'm just going to read to you very quickly uh, Psalm 86.12. It says, I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. Okay, so part of that praise, part of that glory is to glory in his name, is to praise him and in his name. And, and the name that's given above every name, as we saw last week, is the name of Jesus Christ. That is a name that we ought to praise. That is a name that we ought to glory in. Okay? Now, many of these references are in the book of Psalms. Why is that? Because the book of Psalms is the song book of the Bible. Okay? A lot of these Psalms were actually songs that were sung by instruments, that were sung in the temple, and God has given us a, a number of Psalms. You know, if we didn't have our, our, our hymn books, you know, we could always just open the Bible and sing the Psalms. Now, I, I don't know the best tunes to sing these Psalms, you know, there's a lot of people have put uh, the Psalms to music. I'm not really familiar with that many of them. Uh, but this is one sure way that you can praise God by uh, reading the Psalms and, and praising God, praising His name. Another reference is Psalm 111, Psalm 111, verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. And then it says this, In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Okay? So if you've ever wondered, why is church, why is singing involved in the church? You know, none of us, you might say, well, not, there's not many of us that have good voices. There's not many of us that have really beautiful voices to sing out loud. It doesn't matter. We need to set it in our hearts, as it says in Psalm 111 verse 1, that we will sing uh, and praise God in the assembly of the, the upright. Okay, that means this assembly right here ought to be an assembly of the uprights. Okay, this ought to be an assembly of God's people. Okay, we're not trying to make the church a place that's worldly. We're not trying to uh, uh, make people come to our church because we're going to fill them with the world's entertainment. We're not seeking for the unbeliever necessarily. Well, it's a beautiful thing if an unbeliever comes and visits our church. We're not tailoring our church for the unbeliever. Our church is tailored for the upright. It's tailored for the believer so they can hear the word of God and grow and be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, don't you care about the unbelievers? No, that's why we go out and we knock the doors of the people, of the unbelievers, and give them a presentation of the gospel. Okay? So our heart is for the unbeliever, but church is for those that are upright in heart. Okay? And in the congregation. It's for all of us to set our hearts to praise Him. Okay, please never undervalue the song service. Please never undervalue your, your, uh, your, your praise to God. You know, sing with all your heart. 
I would like it if you would lose your voices when you sing, right? Sometimes I lose my voice as I, as I song lead. But it's a good thing. The Lord loves it. He wants your whole heart to be put into the praise of God. I'll just read to you another one. Psalm 138 verse 1. Psalm 138 verse 1. It says, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods. Little, little G, by the way. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Now, this is why, hey, in a society that does not praise God, in a society that has no fear of God, we ought to praise uh, Him. We ought to uh, thank Him uh, in public, okay? So that others around us can see that God still has a remnant of His people on this earth, okay? And when it says little g gods, what I think that's been referred to are people of, of high standing, people of, of uh, that are powerful, maybe the politicians, the leaders in this world, because if you look at that psalm later on, we won't go into it, but it, it talks about these kind of people. And it talks about God's, uh, God's people praising God in, in front of other people, the lost as well. Okay? Now I'm going to read to you a couple more passages. Ephesians 5.19, an instruction that's been given to a church which says, speak into yourselves in psalms. Okay? So we're reading through the psalms, we're studying the psalms, we ought to try to sing the Psalms, and then it says, and hymns, which is why we have a collection of hymn books, okay, and spiritual songs. Hey, listen, you can't take all the music of the world and apply it to church, and apply it to the praise of God. You say, why, why can't we do that? Why can't I take, you know, heavy metal and, and rock and, and rap and fill in the blanks and praise God? Why can't we just take that kind of music and, uh, and uh, put Christian words to it and sing praises to Him like that. Because the Bible says, and spiritual songs. You see, music is a spiritual uh, uh, way of worship, okay? You, and some songs uh, uh, edify the spirit. Some things are spiritual in nature. They don't, uh, uh, they don't um, gratify the flesh. Okay, and a lot of the world's music, all right, a lot of the music of the world, the rock and all those kind of things, does not edify the spiritual man. Okay, it edifies the flesh. And if God tells us that we ought to uh, uh, sing praises that are spiritual, we need to make sure that the songs that we sing are spiritual in nature. Okay, we need to make sure that the songs we sing as well are filled with doctrine. Okay, I don't want to, I don't want to sing a song that's that's hyper repetitive that has no deep doctrine, the reason I love the hymns is because it's almost like you're reading the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that it even comes close to the Bible, okay? but there are deep doctrines in here. There's in, in fact, there are doctrines that I've learned by, by singing hymns, and then I've read my Bible, and I'm like, oh, hold on, that's like the, in that hymn. right? It's the hymn that kind of brought it to my attention, and then I read it through the Bible, and I said, well, that, yeah, that's in that hymn that I, that I sung. Okay? So it's important that we have the right kind of music in this church, Okay, and again, it's not the kind of music that's trying to bring in the lost world. No, we're tailoring this church for God's people. Okay, and if that means that we don't grow into the hundreds like many of the other churches on the Sunshine Coast, so be it. You know, I'm more interested in pleasing the Lord and praising His name than I am about having a huge congregation. Okay, now I hope God builds this church in due time. And I believe He has. I believe He is. You know, uh, but that's not my that's not my goal. Okay, it, it's Jesus that said he will build his church. It's not my goal to do that. That's the goal of Jesus Christ. Okay, as long as we make sure that we sing praise and do things in the right way. Okay, now I'll just read one more passage. Psalm nine, sorry, Psalm fifty nine, verse sixteen. It says, "But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud. Okay, I will sing aloud." Of thy mercy in the morning. Hey, it's the morning. It's Sunday morning. Okay. I want us to be singing aloud. Okay. And you go, oh, Kevin, you don't want to hear my voice loud. I do. Okay. I want to hear it because I know this is praises to God. All right. And I know that's what the Lord wants. Uh, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble, it says. So why is he singing praises out loud? Because he's seen God's hand in his life. He's seen how God has delivered him from trials and troubles. And that's why he's, uh, he's motivated the psalmist here to sing aloud, to sing aloud. And we ought to be uh, singing aloud. We ought to be singing the things of God aloud, all right? And, uh, and then, of course, back in Psalm 9, verse 1, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. 
we're going to revisit this phrase at the end of the sermon, toward the end of the sermon, okay? Now look at verse number 2, Psalm 9 verse 2. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Okay, so what I want you to notice right there is that in this psalm, there are five I wills. Okay, and, and when you say I will do this, you're making a commitment. Okay, you're telling God this is something that I'm going to do for you, Lord. And then it, we saw already in verse 1, it says, I will praise thee. Okay, this is a decision we have to make. This is a commitment that we need to make for the Lord. It also says, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Okay, in verse 2, it says, I will be glad. You might say, Kevin, right now I, I feel, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've not had the best week. You know, I'm feeling quite low. I'm feeling downcast, you know. Well, the Bible says here that you need to decide to be glad. You need to just make the decision before God and say, look, God, I will be glad. It doesn't matter if I've had a hard week. It doesn't matter if things aren't going according to plan. And look, that's life. I mean, life is not a bed of roses. Life will always bring its challenges. We need to get used to it by now, if we haven't already, and just decide, look, it doesn't matter what happens. I will be glad. You know, I, I, this is a decision I will make, and I'll make this commitment to the Lord because of what He's done for me. Verse 2 also says, I will sing praise. Okay, it's one thing to praise God, and sometimes in conversation, we praise God. We thank God for what He's done. And again, verse 2 says, I will sing praise. Okay, this is a commitment. We will sing uh, for you, Lord. And then if you look at verse 14, just drop down to verse 14. It's the last, I will. It says, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Okay, so if you say, Brother Kevin, you know, uh, I, I, have, I have nothing to be joyful about. You say, I will be glad. Well, verse 14, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Hey, that's something you can be glad about, okay? That you have your sins forgiven, that they've been paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross, okay? And that you've been saved, and that you'll never see hell, you'll never see the lake of fire, and that you can uh, reign with Christ for all, forever, that you'll always be with Christ. I mean, these are things worth rejoicing about, right? These are things that we ought to commit to the Lord. Boy, you know, if, if, things, if things have gone really bad for you, you can always rejoice in His salvation. Okay, because that will never be taken away. Okay, so my point is, these I wills are decisions we must make. Okay, these are commitments that we need to make uh, for the Lord. Okay, verse number three. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. I love that statement. All right, whatever enemies you may have. Now, I don't really think I have that many enemies. Maybe, maybe my enemies look at me like my enemy, but to be honest with you, if you said, Kevin, who are your enemies? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't tend to get too upset, even when people have done me wrong. Just, just, uh, just as my nature. I don't really get too upset about it. Uh, but I love the promise that it says, look, in the presence of God, those enemies shall fall and perish. Okay, so it's not me that has to always take up the battle. Many times, it's just God's presence, right? And if I'm in the will of God, if I'm serving the Lord and I'm pleasing Him, and I'm trying to serve Him with my whole heart and trying to praise Him, then I know that at the presence of God, my enemies are going to fail anyway. Now, I'm reminded of, of what we preached about on, um, what did I preach about? On Wednesday, okay, of David and Goliath. And, and if you remember, uh, David uh, stood up against Goliath and defeated Goliath. And then what happened? Once he defeated Goliath and cut off his head with Goliath's sword, the Philistines ran away. They fled. It's kind of that same thing there in verse 3. When my enemies are turned back, they turned back. But what happened? As they fled, the armies of the Lord, the armies of Israel got together and they, they, they pursued the Philistines and uh, destroyed many of them. And that, that's what I'm kind of reminded there is that the enemies, you know, uh, someone like a David who stood up to Goliath, then we saw the armies of the Lord go and defeat those enemies. Okay, and, and I would say at the presence of God, because it's God, it was God's army. It was God's army on this earth that went and destroyed those Philistines. Okay, let's look at verse 4. For thou hast maintained my right hand and my cause. Hey, look, the Lord will defend you. Okay, he's going to maintain, when it says my right, what's it talking about? 
Is, is God always going to defend you no matter what, even when you've done wrong? No. It says that thou hast maintained my rights. It's kind of like saying my righteousness. When I've done right, God's going to maintain that for me. He's going to defend me when I've done right. Okay? And, and my cause. Thou settest in the throne judging right. Okay? Now, uh, if your cause is righteous, if you're seeking to serve Him, and you're doing things to please Him, you're doing the, 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 the righteous things that we see in the Bible, then God will defend it. Okay? And, and as, as us as a church, if we make sure that what we do is right, is righteous, then God will defend our church. Alright? And then, uh, uh, but if your cause is wickedness, you know, don't be surprised if he doesn't defend you. And, you know, don't be surprised if he actually goes on the offense against you. All right. If he brings chastisement or if he allows trials and tribulations to come into your life to hopefully get you back on that right path. Okay. But notice the second part of verse four. It says, thou satest in the throne judging right. What is the purpose of God's throne? Of course, when you think about a throne, we think about authority, we think about power, we think about God being lifted up. But he uses his throne to judge right. Now, that doesn't mean that all God does is judge the righteous. No, when it says he's judging, when he's uh, judging right, is that his judgment is always right. His judgment is always righteous. So whether he's judging what is right, or whether if he's judging that which is evil or wicked, his judgment is always right. Okay? And God is a God that passes judgment. All right? Never get to a point, and I don't think we will as a church. All right? Because even if I go soft, I know some of the men are going to be like, Kevin, come on. You know, toughen up or something, right? Never get to the point where you think God does not judge the wicked. Okay? Never get to the point where you think, well, God just uh, tolerable, tolerant to anything. God allows anything to go. You know, God, God allows homosexual marriage or God allows, you know, a, a abortion. He's, he's fine with these kind of things. No, he's not. All right? His judgments are always right. And if you're like, I don't know, I don't know how God judges. Well, just become familiar with this book. All right? This book is filled with the judgments of God. This book is filled with telling us what is right and what is wrong. Okay? And I don't need to tell you. I don't need to come up with my personal reason to tell you why homosexuality or, or other wicked sins are, are, are wrong and sh should not be, uh, should be not be legalized, you know, like marriage and all those kind of things. It's because the, the Word of God tells us. I don't need to make that up. Alright? We just preach boldly what the Word of God says. The Bible tells us in John 7, you guys might want to turn there. Keep your finger there. Turn to John 7.24. John 7.24. If God's judgment is right, and He's given us His book, so we know what His judgments are, what do you think the expectation will be upon His people? What do, what do people say? Many times they say, you, you shouldn't judge, right? If you're judging, you're, 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 you're in the wrong, you, 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 you know. Uh, and yet, we see that God is a God of judgment. He's told us His judgment, and we're His people. And He tells us to read His book, so we become familiar with what is right and wrong. All right? So John 7.24. John 7.24. The Bible says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Hey, are we commanded to judge? Are we commanded to make judgment calls? Yes, we are. Okay? But are we, are we to judge based on our own opinions? No, it says, judge righteous judgment. Hey, your judgment needs to be righteous. When you decide to do something as a family, you know, you're, you're in a position and you need to make a decision, or someone's in sin and, and you need to decide, hey, is this wrong? Or maybe you're in sin. Maybe, maybe you're doing something that's not pleasing the Lord. You need, you need to pass judgment upon yourself. You need to make sure that judgment is righteous. Just like the judgment of God is righteous. Okay? So we need to judge, yes, righteously. How do we do that? By knowing the Word of God. Okay? When you make a decision, it ought to be built on the Word of God. Whether it's something that's clear, black and white, or whether you're just taking principles from the Bible and then applying that to situations 
uh, of your life. Okay? Now drop down to John 5.30. Go back two chapters. John 5.30. John 5.30. And remember, Jesus Christ, when he came on this earth, he came and he set an example for us. Okay? He was God, yes. Okay? But he also came and set his example so we would follow after his steps. And what does he say in John 5.30? He says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Now, before we keep reading, Jesus says, look, I judge. And my judgment is just. That's like another way of saying it's righteous. It's always correct. All right? But how did Jesus ensure that his judgment was just? How did he make sure that it was always righteous and perfect? He says, uh, uh, continuing on, it says, Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which have sent me. Okay, if you want your judgment to be just and righteous, then you need to stop seeking your own will on the matter and seek the will of the Father. Okay? That's how we do it. And of course, Jesus was God. Of course, if Jesus passed judgment of his, of his own will, it's going to be righteous and perfect anyway. But he sets the example, right? It's not his own will that he's seeking, but the will of God, the will of the Father that he's seeking to do. All right? And so... You know, if you don't read your Bible, how will you know what the will of God is? If you don't read your Bible, how will you know how to pass righteous and just judgment? Okay, if you don't read your Bible, how will you know that me as the pastor is preaching something correct from behind the pulpit? You know, every, every person you hear, you need to pass judgment. You ought to be passing judgment right now. You ought to be saying, yes, this is in the word of God. Yes, this is correct. You know? And if it's correct, hey, say amen if you want, right? But at the same time, you can't just accept any preacher. You can't just accept anybody that uh, talks about Jesus. You need to pass judgment. And there are many, many preachers that take advantage of the church congregation because they don't know their Bibles and they'll just preach anything. Okay? Now, that should not be the case. This is why our church is built on the Word of God because it's not my will, it's not my opinions, though sometimes you'll get my opinions, but hopefully it's an opinion based on, the, based on the principles that we see of the Word of God. And you need to make sure that you pass judgment of any preacher that you hear. It doesn't matter if it's your favorite preacher and he's turned out to be awesome all this time. No matter what sermon you hear, you always need to make sure that you measure it up, compare it to the Word of God. Okay? Because at the end of the day, we all have the flesh. You know, hopefully the preacher's filled with the Holy Ghost and they're preaching, but sometimes they can preach out of their flesh. It can happen, okay? Let's go back to Psalm 9, verse 5. Psalm 9, verse 5. The Bible says, Thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. Hey, we already said that the judgment of God is righteous and just. Some of that judgment means that he has to rebuke the heathen or destroy the wicked. And these are attributes of God that people don't love. People don't like these attributes of God. But his judgment is right. Okay? And to, to rebuke the heathen is to, to uh, correct sharply. Hey, you know, God corrects very sharply the heathen. Okay? Heathen, does that mean Gentile? Not you? I mean, it can refer to a Gentile. But more often it refers to someone that worships uh, a false god or worships idols or whatever. You know, it doesn't worship the God of the Bible. Okay? So God rebukes the heathen. He destroys the wicked. And he causes, he says, to put out their name forever and ever. You know, God has the ability to cause a wicked person to be destroyed and for their, you know, name to never be remembered anymore. I mean, the world must be filled with wicked people. People that thought they would make a name for themselves that we probably don't even read about in the history books because God saw fit. Hey, you, you're, not, you're not worth it. You're not worth to be remembered. I'm going to make sure that your name's not remembered at all. I mean, that's what the Bible says, okay? And you might say, but I know a lot of wicked people that, that we remember that are, you know, documented throughout history. Well, yeah, you know, maybe God's allowed that for a certain reason, 
But, you know, God has the ability to make your name forgotten, okay? To have no uh, remembrance, no reputation, okay? But also, I think we can apply this to the book of life. We can apply this to, to the book of life. Uh, we can apply this spiritually. I'll just read to you from Revelation 3, 5. The Bible says, He that overcometh, talking about someone that has placed their faith on Christ, it says, The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Hey, if you, you're an overcomer, if you're someone that's saved by Jesus Christ and his shed blood, God promises that he will not blot out your name out of the book of life. Okay? That is eternal security. That is once saved, always saved. Once you've been forgiven, you can never lose it. It's, it's forever. You know, you can live as a wicked Christian. I mean, that's not a good thing. God will judge you. God will chastise you on this earth, but you'll be, you're still forgiven because Jesus Christ has paid for all your sins. Okay? But your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. And then it says, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Wow, that's going to be an amazing time. When Jesus Christ, you know, we stand before God, the father and, and the angels and the hosts of heaven. And Jesus says, yep, you know, Jason is one of mine. You know, Callum, he's one of mine. Yep, I know him. You know, Kevin, yep, he's one of mine. Matthew and, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. And he, he names all our names before God and before the angels. That's going to be a marvelous time, right? That's, that's the glory for me, you know, and we're thinking about uh, uh, the glory that we have is, is through Christ, okay? Hey, but this tells me, this also tells me that the wicked will have their names removed out of the book of life. And I actually preached on this in Sydney. I won't go through it now, but I have covered it with you before. This is why I, I, I believe, I think the Bible is quite clear on this, is that everybody's name uh, has been written at some point in the book of life. Because Jesus Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, okay? And that he's, he's paid for, he's tasted death uh, for every man, okay? He's died for the sins of every man. So it would make logical sense that the names of everybody were named, were written in the book of life. But you get to a point where you become reprobate or you die without receiving Christ, you rejected Christ, then God's going to take out your name out of that book of life, Okay? And that name of the wicked, the name of the non-believer, that they won't be remembered anymore. They, they're gone. They're gone from God's eternal book. All right? Psalm 9, verse 6. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetu perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities, their memorial is perished with them. Now that word perpetual there, anyone know what that means? Perpetual? Never ends. Okay, so let's read that again. Destructions are come to a, a never-ending end. <laughs> That's basically what it's saying, okay? So their end, the end of the wicked, or the end of the enemies, will never end. All right? Their end will never end. All right? Now, this is a sad truth. If someone is, uh, does not believe on Jesus Christ, if someone rejects the Lord, and they're cast into hell, and ultimately the lake of fire, their end will never end. Okay? Their end will never end. They will never escape the lake of fire. They will never escape hell. Okay? Their end is forever. And that is how God destroys His enemies. That is how, that's how far God goes with destroying the wicked. Okay? And it says, And thou hast destroyed cities. So this sounds like the enemies here, uh, uh, um, armies of the enemy, and they're going around destroying different cities. Uh, but then it says their, their memorial is perished with them. So even the destruction of the enemies that they've caused is not going to be remembered. Okay? Again, it's just talking about how uh, wicked people, God will make it, so nobody even remembers their name. Even the destruction even how they've overcome different cities, you know, in their, in their path of glory, none of that's going to be remembered, all right? I mean, again, the, the, a lot of cities are buried deep in the earth, you know, because of, of the changes that are in the earth and all these kind of things. And then you see archaeologists, they dig up some old city or something, and nobody knows really what it was or, you know, who was the, who, who was the king of that city or, 
you know, who, who overthrew this city. No one knows a lot of those names, okay? And if this world continues, you know, a lot of the wicked people of that we know of today, their names aren't going to be remembered, okay? And there's going to be new generations over and over again. Hey, but we saw that God will never blot out our names at the book of life. We're going to be remembered forever. Jesus Christ is going to name us before the Father and before the holy angels. Verse number 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared His throne for judgment. There we see again, what is the purpose of His throne? To sit there and be glorified? Yes. But is that all? No, to pass judgment. He's preparing His throne for judgment. But it says at the beginning, but the Lord shall endure forever. So the enemies, the wicked, their names are going to be forgotten. They're going to come to an end. They're going to have a perpetual end. Their end's never going to end. But what's going to endure forever? Our Lord God. Okay, so the best place to be is to be His child, to be in His family, to be in His will. Because the Lord's going to endure forever. You know, Jesus is the beginning and the ending, isn't He? Okay? Besides that, uh, you know, God will always be. The Lord will always be. That's His eternal nature. Okay? Time has no power over God. It's God that has power over time. Okay? God is outside of time. Okay? God is the beginning and the ending. Okay? Um, but it's, I also like how it says, he hath prepared his throne for judgment. Okay, because this is, this is the side of God that we, we love. Alright? I think we know that God sometimes should chastise us, should pass judgment upon us. But it says God prepares. Okay? He takes his time. Okay? Meaning that God is long suffering. God is merciful. We covered this before. He gives us time to get things right. He gives us time uh, to say sorry, to apologize, to fix things, okay? It's better that God will pass His judgment upon us as we're improving, <laughs> as we've noticed our own mistakes and we're choosing to make things, things better, okay? Hey, if we ever make mistakes, you know, take the criticism. You know, don't get angry at people that criticize you for making a mistake. Take it. You deserve it, all right? Apologize and then fix it. These are the three things that we ought to be doing when we do wrong, okay? And then hopefully once God passes judgment, He's like, well, you've already judged yourself. You're already making things better, you know? So His judgment won't be as, 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 uh, as, as uh, harsh as it could be upon us, as, upon His people, okay? Uh, but yeah, you know, God prepares judgment. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. He's not quick to pass judgment, okay? And again, we spoke about this. The wicked, you know, they think, oh, wow, why doesn't God judge me? Why isn't God passing judgment or he's giving you time and if you choose to use that time to do more wickedness then once God does judge you that judgment's going to be even harsher okay it's going to be even harder upon you verse number eight and he shall judge the world in righteousness he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness okay and again God promises that he's going to judge this is something he shall do. Okay? You be patient with God. Saying, why, God, why haven't you stepped in? Why haven't you stepped in now and made things right? Why haven't you destroyed the wicked? Be patient. God will do it. Okay? But notice what it says there. It says that he shall judge the world in righteousness. Again, just reinforcing the fact that his judgment is just. His judgment is always perfectly right. Okay? And again, we, we, we struggle with the thought of people going into hell, especially if they're loved ones that we know that rejected Christ. And that's hard for us to, to uh, absorb, right? But we must understand that His judgment is right. Okay? This is the right thing for people that reject Christ to die in their sins and go into hellfire. Okay? His judgment is just and always perfectly right. But then notice that He says, he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Okay? So not only, by the way, what that uprightness means is that God himself is righteous without any fault. Okay? So not only does he pass judgment righteously, but the reason he's able to do it perfectly and just and righteously is because he himself is uprighteous. He himself is righteous. He himself is perfect and pure. Okay? And that's why his judgment can always be right. 
And I think we can apply this to ourselves, all right? If you, uh, you know, and look, none of us are perfect, okay? And, and the fact is, because none of us are perfect, our judgment is not always going to be perfect, okay? Th that's just a reality. But if we want our just judgment to be more right, if we want it to be more aligned with the Lord, then we need to clean up our lives. We need to try to live lives that are upright, that people can see, hey, this person is trying to live in accordance to the laws of God. This person is trying to live in accordance to the commands of God. And if that's something you're striving to do, then when you pass judgment, it's going to be more right. It's going to be more just. Okay? Just, it's going to naturally flow from you, flow from you, because you're in the will of God. Now, uh, verse number nine. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Hey, what's a refuge? A refuge is a place of safety, a place of protection. All right. Uh, remember, uh, on, on Wednesday, we, I preached on King Joash, right? King Joash, who was being uh, persecuted. You know, his grandmother was trying to kill him as a one-year-old. Hey, King Joash, he found refuge. He found refuge with his aunt and uncle in the temple of God. Okay, it's a place of safety, a place of protection, a place where your enemy will not find you. Okay? And the Bible says that the Lord will be our refuge. Okay? If you're going through troubles and difficulties, all right, where should you go? You're to run like a refugee. Run for your life. Where? To God. Okay? It says the Lord will be our refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. You know, we need to remember this because I think sometimes when we're struggling, you know, we are... Uh, we go through uh, tribulation or trials, maybe we seek the answer within ourselves. Hey, but no, we need to first just run to the Lord. Just run for His help. Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to defend you. Ask the Lord to give you safety and protection. Okay? That is our great God. Our great God that passes judgment. Okay? That destroys the wicked. Okay? He's got a strong hand against the enemies. Is the same God that has a strong hand to look after you, to protect you, to keep you safe. I mean, which side of God do you want to be on? Right? The one where he's destroying the enemies, destroying the wicked, or the one that's protecting you? Obviously, you want to be in the refuge of God. Okay. Verse number 10. And they that know thy name will, will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Hey, God's not going to forsake you. That's the promise, the beautiful promise I'll just go to, I'll read to you from Deuteron Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Be, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Hey, why can we be strong and courageous as believers? Why? Because the Lord will not fail us. Okay? He will, he, he, he will always be with us. He will never forsake us if we know His name. The promises that we get from God are truly beautiful that we see in the Bible. Hey, we, need to, we put our trust in Him. We put our trust in the Lord Jesus and His perfect sacrifice. Hey, then God will not forsake us. Okay, again, once you're saved, you're always saved. Okay, and He will always be there for you. Always be there, ready to receive you into His arms. Verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. So, in the Old Testament, Zion often referred to as Jerusalem, right? And so, it's basically talking about the people of Israel uh, that, came, that came to worship the Lord at the temple. It says those people, God's people, will sing praises to the Lord, okay? And uh, declare among the people his doings. So, what I want to say to you, even though we're not Old Testament saints, okay, even though we don't go into Jerusalem, into the temple to offer our, our offerings, we are people of Zion. Okay? And they say, are you a Zionist, Kevin? All right? I guess I am. I guess I'm a, I'm a biblical Zionist. Okay? I'm a biblical Zionist. And um, keep your finger there. Let's go to Hebrews 12. Keep your finger there. Go to Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews 12.22. Sorry, Matt, but I am a Zionist. There you go. Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews 12.22. 
This is written to the believers, the New Testament believers, Hebrews 12, 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. We, we've come to Mount Zion. What is it? And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Guys, our eternal destination is Zion. And what is it? It's that heavenly uh, Jerusalem. It's the city of God that will descend from heaven. When God creates a new heaven and a new earth, that will be our place. Okay? We are people that dwell in Zion, spiritually speaking. Okay? And ultimately, that's going to come in full fruition at the end of the millennium. And then verse 23. If you say, no, that's not for us, Kevin. That's for the Jews. Verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hey, we ought to be biblical Zionists. That is our home. That is the place that we would want to be forever with the Lord. Okay? When there's no more sin, when we have our resurrected bodies and we can sing praises to God. Okay? So you might say, well, we're not children of, of, uh, of earthly Zion. Well, we're children of, of heavenly Zion. How much better is heavenly Zion than a piece of land on the earth? Okay? A piece of land that people are fighting over. It's not worth it. Okay? The, the real Zion, the heavenly Zion, is a free gift available to us through Jesus Christ. And I'll get you to turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 1. Because I was harping on the need for us to be praising and singing praises to God. Alright? Singing praises to God. Those that which dwell in Zion, which dwell in Zion, as, as it said in Psalm 9, 1. Look at Revelation 14, verse 1. Revelation 14, verse 1. Look at the consistency here. It says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ. A lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him, an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Hey, what are they doing on, on Mount Zion? Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven, as a voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers, harping with their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Hey, Zion is a place of singing. A place of playing instruments, of singing praises to God. We see this here in Psalm, and we see this all the way, ultimately pictured of the new Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, with the Lamb and the praises still being sung. Get used to singing the praises of God is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay? Because you're going to be doing it for all eternity. Okay? And, hey, with these 144,000, you know, uh, go back to Psalm 9. Go back to Psalm 9, verse 12. Psalm 9, verse 12. This is speaking of God. It says, When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Hey, we saw that God causes that the names of the wicked would not be remembered, they'd be forgotten. Hey, but God says, I'm not going to forget the cry of the humble. It says, when he maketh inquisition for blood. Hey, the death of his saints, the death of God's people does not go unnoticed. It says, God makes inquisition. Why? He goes and inquires. He finds out every detail of the death and suffering of his saints. Okay? God does not leave any stone unturned when he's going to pass judgment for the death and suffering of his people. Okay? Now, of course... You know, we can say, well, why does God have to make inquisition? God knows all things. I think what this is saying is it just highlights that God pays, play, pays close attention to the death of his saints. Okay? Because sometimes we might see God's people suffering, dying, you know, maybe dying for their faith in some places in this world. And we're like, God, why aren't you doing anything? God is passing inquisition. He's making inquisition. He's making sure that when he passes judgment, He's got every piece of detail available to him to make the right decision. Okay? And he will pass judgment. He will not forget the cry of the humble. Alright? 
God promises us that all our suffering, it will be dealt with at some point. Okay? God will make sure that, that judgment is passed righteously. Verse 13. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou hast lifted me up from the gates of death. So, you see the psalmist here asking for mercy. Consider my trouble. Hey, it's not just the blood, like I said, but the suffering, the trouble of the saints that, that God considers, that God makes inquisition of. All right? And it seems like this psalmist, I'm not, I don't think it's a, a psalm of David. It could be a psalm of David. It could be another psalmist. But it says that he was lifted up from the gates of death. Okay? Somehow, this man was being uh, persecuted to death. Okay? But the Lord stepped in and delivered him out of that, lifted him out of, out of, out of the, the gates of death. And then verse 14 kind of goes together with that. It says that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. So if Zion represents Jerusalem, then a daughter of Zion would represent another city in Israel. Okay? So it seems like the psalmist was in some other area, some other city, and he was delivered out of these gates of the daughter of Zion. It says, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then it says, because he was, deli- he was delivered from death, it says, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Okay, that's what we just read about. Now, the context of this is obviously a, a physical salvation. This guy was being persecuted to death. He was delivered from that. And then he can rejoice in the salvation that God has given him. Okay? Now, God has saved us from numerous things. I'm not even talking about our spiritual our needs. Hey, but if we, weren't without, if we were without the Lord, if we did not know the commands and the laws of God, I guarantee you, you would have destroyed your life, even more so. You might say, well, I've already destroyed my life somehow, you know, but by disobeying the Lord. Hey, if we didn't have the words of God, you would have destroyed your life even more. Okay, God has saved us from our sins. God has saved us from a lot of destruction that we can have upon this earth had we not turned to Him and, and upheld His word and believed it. Okay, but of course, I said we can apply this to the salvation of our souls. Hey, we ought to rejoice in that salvation. That ought to be something that we can always praise God about. Something that can always lift our spirits is knowing that the Lord has saved us. You might say, well, I can't really think about times where God has saved me in this life. Well, God has saved you for all eternity. That's even better. Okay, That's something that you can rejoice over. Look at verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pits that they made in the nets which they hid is their own foot taken. So God often uses the evil devices that wicked men have created for their own downfall. Okay? Their own downfall. God often turns the table on the wicked uh, to protect His people. To protect God's people. Okay? Now, uh, look at verse uh, 16. This goes well with verse 15. It says, The Lord is known by the judgment which He executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. He gay on Selah. So, if, if you ever see wicked people fall in their own pits, you know, they come up with some device to persecute God's people, they come up with some way to try to destroy others, and then you see them fall in their own traps, they fall by their own sword, if you will, then you know, in verse 16, it says that the Lord is known by the judgment which He executed. Okay? So again, if you see wicked people fall by their own sword, you know it was God that stepped in and caused that to happen. God is known by that kind of judgment. Okay? That's basically what it says there. Now, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Ah, hell! Right? How many churches don't even want to talk about hell? They're too afraid to mention hell. Okay? The, the Bible's clear that God sends the wicked into hell. And I've heard people say, no, you don't understand. God is loving. God will never send anyone to hell. They send themselves to hell. No. God is the one that turns the wicked into hell. He's the one that does it. Okay? It's His call at the end of the day when those that have rejected Christ 
uh, stand before the Lord in judgment, he's going to be the one that takes them and casts them into hell. The hand of the Lord. Okay, it's his doing. Okay, yes, it, it is their own doing as well. You know, they've done it to themselves, but it's God that steps in and does it. Okay? And um, of course, you know, let me just read to you. Familiar passages to you. You don't need to turn there. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. Not perish where? Not perish in hell, but have everlasting life. Hey, God has come to give us everlasting life. He does not seek, he has no pleasure in people perishing. That's not his plan. Okay? That's why he sent Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross. Okay? He does not want the wicked in hell. Okay? He wants them saved. But should they choose to reject Christ, that's going to be their ultimate destination. Verse 18, it says, He that believeth on him, the one that believes on Jesus, is not condemned. Okay? You're not going to pass through condemnation if you believe on Jesus Christ. And then it says, But he that believeth not, the one that does not believe on Christ, is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay? Why does God send people to hell? Ultimately, ultimately, it's because they rejected Jesus Christ. You know, we're all deserving of hell. We're all deserving of it because we've all sinned. Okay? But what sends them to hell, ultimately, is, is because they've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. If you've believed on Jesus Christ, you have right now, you don't have to wait for it, you have it right now, everlasting life, which means you can never die, spiritually speaking, okay? And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Guys, this is the message we need to take to our community, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, aren't you inviting them to church? Yeah, we'll invite them to church, okay? But them coming to church is not going to save them. Yes, you know, we'll answer their questions if we have time, okay? But answering their questions on secondary doctrines are not going to save them. What's going to save our community is the preaching of the gospel, is for them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not their ability to turn from sins that's going to save them. Okay, it, It's not uh, coming to our church that's going to save them. It's not getting baptized that's going to save them. Okay, it, It's not cleaning up their life and turning a new leaf that's going to save them. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ 100% with their whole hearts. That's what's going to deliver the people from hell. You guys are in Psalm 9, right? Psalm 9 verse 18. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish, uh, shall not perish forever. So, uh, you know, God does not forget the poor and needy. Okay? You may go through this life as poor, as needy. Okay? You might never be the richest, you know, the, the most well off and the most things. Hey, God will always provide for your needs. If you're God's people and you have needs, if you're poor, God will provide for you okay you set the kingdom of god first and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you the bible says right all these things your clothing your food the need the needs you have to get through life god will always provide the very base things to get you through life okay god does not forget but look matthew 5 3 i'll just read to you quickly matthew 5 3 the words of jesus christ he says blessed are the poor in spirit hey if you're poor God says you're blessed. Say, why? Why is that blessed? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hey, listen. If you're a child of God, if you're saved, but you go through this life poor, you're blessed. Because yours is the kingdom of heaven. You can be poor on this earth, but if you're a child of God, you have the riches of heaven for all eternity. That's why you're blessed. Okay, you're more blessed than the richest, most powerful man on this earth if they reject Christ. 
Okay, because it's temporal. They won't be remembered. They'll be cast into hell. But you will endure with, with God forever in Christ. Look at verse 19. Arise, O Lord, let, no man, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Okay, so... Yeah, just you got the psalm saying, let not man prevail. So uh, the, the desire of a righteous man is that wickedness will come to an end at some point. That they will not prevail. Okay, they'll, they'll come to a sharp end and that God will judge righteously. You know, even, yes, the judgment of hell. Even the judgment of hellfire, God will judge uh, righteously. And verse 20, verse 20, it says, Put them in fear, O Lord. Hey, those that are not believers in Christ, we want them in fear that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Again, back to soul winning. Our goal is to put a bit of fear of God into the hearts of the people. Okay? So they know that they are but men. Hey, they are, you're just a man. You cannot save yourself. Okay? You cannot acquire eternal life on your own. Okay? So it is our desire to put some fear of God into them. Okay? If you did not have a fear of God, you would never have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you think you can do it on your own. Okay? And how many people do we knock on? And they'll say, she'll be right. I'll be fine. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good enough. I think I'm going to heaven. I'm pretty sure I am because I'm a good person. Hey, they're lacking a fear of God, these people. Okay? So when we take the Bible and we show them that they're sinners, okay, and sinners are deserving of hell, it ought to put a bit of fear in them. Okay, that's our goal, to put a bit of fear of God. Now, I wanted to uh, bring you back to, to verse number one. Look at verse number one. Psalm 9, verse 1. Now that we've gone through the whole psalm, it says, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Now you might say, what are the marvelous works? What are the marvelous works? A lot of people will think of the good things, right? Of all the blessings of God, of the, the mercy of God. Look, uh, verse number four, you know, the works of his love. Verse number four is that God will maintain our cause, right? Verse number nine is that he's a refuge for the oppressed. Verse number 10, that he will not forsake his people. Verse 13, that he's merciful, God 14 is that he's a God of salvation. And verse 18 is that he's a provider for the poor and needy. Okay? When, when we want to show forth the works of God, we often think about these good things that we see about in the Bible. But is that all the works of God? What did it say? In verse 1, I will show forth all, all thy marvelous works. All of it. Okay? What's verse 3 about? that the enemies will perish. Verse 5, that the wicked will be destroyed. Verse 6, that there's no memorial for the wicked. Verse 15, that the heathen will sink, in, sink into their own pits. And verse 17, that the wicked will be thrown into hell. Hey, these works are also marvelous works of God. You can't just go with the good and ignore the bad. Well, it's not bad. It's righteous. It's, it's right. Okay? The marvelous works that we ought to show forth, the marvelous works, all of it, that we need to preach about, are all these things. Hey, the good things of God, you know, His love, but we also need to preach His wrath. We need to preach His hatred. We need to preach His anger. This is the true God. Okay? The true God is that He's got a, an amazing love. Okay? And it's such an amazing love that He sent Jesus Christ. But He's also a God full of wrath. And if we're going to do this accurately, if we're going to show forth all his marvelous works, then it's both these things. Okay? God judging the wicked, destroying the wicked, and casting him into hell, the Bible calls this marvelous works. Okay? Marvelous works. 2 Timothy 4.2. 2 Timothy 4.2. I'll just read it to you. You guys turn to Acts 20. You guys turn to Acts 20. Turn to Acts 20, and I'll read to you from 2 Timothy 4.2. The Bible says these are instructions for pastors, instructions for preachers. It says, preach the word. 
You say, why do you have so many scriptures in the Bible? Because we're instructed to preach the word. Hey, it doesn't say preach Kevin's opinions. Okay? It doesn't say preach things that you want to hear necessarily. It says preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? In season or out of season? It doesn't matter. You know, if we preach things that are not uh, accepted by the world today, we still need to preach it if it's out of season. Okay? We, we preach the things that are in season, that's people, things that people want to hear, and the things that are out of season, the things that people don't want to hear. We still have to preach the Word. Okay? We can't ignore the Bible. And then it says in verse 3, why? Why is this so important that we make sure we're a church that preaches the Word? Because it says in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I would say to you that time has come. Okay, We are in a time when people are wanting preaching that will ticker their itching ears. Someone will come and scratch your ears and it'll feel good. Hey, they want the feel-good sermons all the time. They want to know how God loves them, you know, all the time. How God's not going to pass judgment on their wickedness. How God's just going to continue being long-suffering. God's just going to continue being merciful on this whole world. How you can be as wicked and as sinful as you want to be. And God just loves it. You know, God says, no. Okay? That is not sound doctrine. And this is why it's my desire to preach through the Bible, chapter by chapter. Because I'm not going to be able to skip things. And I'm trying my best to go verse by verse, okay? I, I don't know all the verses. I don't know what they all mean, okay? But I just do my best that, that God has given me see, see fit to preach through things chapter by chapter because this is one way to ensure that we preach the whole word, okay? You guys are in, in Acts 20, Acts 20, 26. Acts 20, 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why? Was he pure from the blood of all men? He says in verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All of it. All of it must be preached. Okay? Uh, I'm not trying to avoid passages. Sometimes I've, I've turned to something, like I'm going chapter by chapter, I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I, I, I wish I could avoid it. Okay? But when I don't really understand it, then I've got to read it again and read it again maybe compare other passages, until I have something to tell you because I want to preach all the counsel of God. Hey, this is the right thing to do. I don't want to have the blood of any man upon me. Okay, I don't want to have the blended blood of any man upon me. So I want to be, in this way, preaching the whole counsel of God. Verse 28, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. Hey, what am I going to feed you with? All the counsel. In season, out of season, the whole word. Even the stuff that's not pleasant to our ears. Alright? Which he have purchased with his own blood. And look at verse 29. For I know this. The reason I do this. The reason why the whole word needs to be preached. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Hey, how do we make sure... That the, that, the, that the wolves, because they will come in. The Bible says, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Okay? So, the way we overcome the wolves is to preach the whole word of God. That's how we do it. Because at some point, the wolves going to come in. They're not going to like the fact that as a church, we preach the whole word of God. They're either going to leave, okay, or when they try to cause problems, they're not going to be able to harm us because we, we stand true on what the Word of God says. We have a strong foundation in the Word of God. All right? So, you know, it's said there in Psalm 9.1, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Okay? And then in Psalm 9.11, it said at the end, declare among the people his doings. Hey, we need to declare, we need to show all of the doings of God, all of the works of God, and all his works are marvelous. Okay, even when he judges and destroys the wicked, those are his marvelous works. And of course, 
the most important message, guys. Going out there, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is an amazing, marvelous work of His love. All right? That is just as important. Let's pray.